Um, it's a pleasure to be here again, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I work for, a, a very quick word, I work for Chagask, that's how you pronounce it. It's the Irish Agriculture and Food Development Authority. We do three things. We do research on agriculture in Ireland. We do farmer uh, advisory or extension, if you like, and we do farm education together in one organization. Now, my role is to, to look after the translational research on sustainable food production. Sustainable food production speaks for itself. Sustainable res um, translational research means bringing all the knowledge and data together and translating that into messages. Mainly, I work mainly on the policy side. And also scanning the policy horizon and bringing that back in terms of identifying new research areas. And I'm very pleased to be here with my colleagues Gary and Trevor that I work very closely with in this, in this context. Now today I'd like to zoom in on one aspect of sustainability and that is the hot topic of greenhouse gases from agriculture. Uh, particularly in the context of the COP21 that will take place next month in Paris. That is the burning excuse to burn topic. And we see a very strong debate in Ireland, also in Europe and indeed globally, on where we're going with agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. And the debate, in my opinion, is stuck. We're not making much progress at the moment. We are on the science side, but in the public debate, debate it is stuck. One side saying we need more food, we need food security, and the other side saying we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and the only way to do that is less agriculture. Now, what I'd like to do here today is to replace that question, do we need more agriculture or less agriculture, which, which is where the debate is stuck, with four questions, more nuanced questions, that we can work on, that we can make progress on, to try and get the best of those two worlds, more food, less greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I'm preparing a paper on this topic with my colleagues in the FAO, and before we start writing the paper, I'd like to offer you some thoughts and I welcome the feedback before we start writing. So let me start, given that today is about European policies, let me start our story here with the latest conclusion from, from, from the European side, the European Council conclusion step from last October on a uh, climate and energy framework for 2030. And in, in my mind, that's the most relevant horizon. Of course, we've got the 2020 agreement, but 2020 is tomorrow, and, and it, it will happen. So now we're looking at 2030 and the policy horizon. Now, in, that, in those conclusions that dealt with the entire economy, a call from Poland and, and all sorts of things, but there's one paragraph dealing with agriculture. That's paragraph 2.14. And let me translate that for you. In very simple terms, there's three sentences there. And the first sentence states that agricultural greenhouse gas emissions should not be reduced at the expense of food security. It's almost parity of esteem, if you like. Food security, very important. Greenhouse gas emissions, very important. They should not be uh, uh, met at the expense of each other. Now, how can we do that? How can we produce more food and at the same time reduce emissions. And what we've come up with is, and what we'd like to propose here today, is literally a new equation for climate smart agriculture. And I'm going to indulge in some mathematics in an equation. I'll try and keep it simple. First, let's look at food production. The amount of food we produce in the world depends on two things. One is, the first thing is what we call activity data, that is the number of hectares that we farm, or the number of cows that we keep, and we multiply that with a productivity factor. The amount of number of tons of food we get from one hectare, or the amount of milk we get from one cow. The amount of greenhouse gases that is derived from agriculture has a very similar equation. The amount of greenhouse gases depends on the activity, again, number of hectares, number of cows, multiply what we now call emission intensity. So that is, for example, nitrous oxide emissions per hectare or methane emissions per cow. Now, let's have a look at that. Let's investigate what we can do here. Let's first look at the productivity factor because if we increase productivity, we can increase food. 
This is a famous map, global map, the yield gap map, that shows the potential in various parts of the world to increase productivity. We see that in large parts of Europe and America, that gap is close to zero, or close to our potential yield. But there's other parts of the world where there's huge potential to increase yields per hectare, if you like. Now, if you want to put that in, in, into, into a picture, this is a project that we worked on in or, or visited as part of our work in Tanzania. <clears throat> and this is rain-fed rice production uh, in Tanzania, where we get one crop of rice, two tons per hectare per crop is two tons per hectare per year. Okay? If you turn the camera the other way, literally <coughs> on the other side of the road, irrigated, uh, introduction of technology, also introduction of knowledge packages through farmer field schools, together, now they grow two crops of rice, four tons per hectare per year, eight tons per hectare of, per hectare of rice. Okay? That is the, the intensification. You'd be pleased to hear that this was a Dutch irrigation system. <laughs> <laughs> Next door was an American irrigation system that worked with pumps. Pumps broke down. The Dutch system was gravity fed. So. It was Holland 1, American Hill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to that. We can all agree it's a good thing to increase productivity. Now let's look at the activity data, the area in the world that we're farming. This is a paper published recently in PLOS One, and, and you can see many different projections and simulations, but they all more or less tell the same thing. What we see here is the increase in productivity for, the world, for four of the world's major crops. Okay? The historic growth in productivity. And the solid line here is where we simply extrapolate the current increase in productivity into the future for each crop. The dotted line, however, is the increase that would be needed if we want to feed the growing population on the same area of agricultural land. Okay? And that poses a challenge for us that, and of course the error bars are enormous, but this suggests that the current increase in productivity may be insufficient to meet world demand by 2050 based on, a, on, on no change in diet. Or in current, sorry, based on a continuation of current trends in diet. Now, that poses the question, is there a need to increase the agricultural activity data? Okay, question mark. I'm going to park that here and I'm going to come back to it. Let's look at the greenhouse gas emissions. First we look at the emission intensities. How can we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions per cow or per hectare? Well, there's quite a few things we can do there. We can work on reducing nitrous oxides per hectare. We can reduce on methane emissions per cow. And this is where the data from Ireland that shows that over the last 20 years, we have reduced the emission intensities, we've expressed it as carbon dioxide equivalents per calorie food pr produced. We've managed to reduce those through more efficient farming and we're projecting that we will continue to reduce, reduce that into the future. Okay? And we can agree that that is a good thing. Lower emission intensity is a good thing. But, let's now look at the activity data. Here's the same green dots. The emission intensity is declining, but the yellow line here, projection, is for the total amount of food produced. And we're projecting that we will increase our food production. If you multiply the two, you get our greenhouse gas emissions, and they are very stubborn. It's very hard to reduce total greenhouse gas emissions. Which in Ireland, oh sorry, before we go to Ireland, New Zealand, very same story. They've reduced the emission intensity of their milk but they've increased more than doubled their milk production. As a result, their methane emissions in total is going up. Okay? As a result of that, there's a debate in Ireland whether there's a need to reduce agricultural activity. If we can't manage to reduce our greenhouse gases just by reducing the intensity alone, is there a need to reduce activity? So now we come to the heart of the debate. Let's agree what we can agree on. More efficient productivity, everybody wants it. It's good. Lower emission intensity, everybody wants it. It's good. But where we're stuck is whether we need 
higher activity data or lower activity data. That depends where you're coming from. Now, sometimes the solution to a recalcitrant problem is to transcend it. Transcend it is to go one level higher where, where it doesn't become a conflict anymore. And I'm proposing that here we're doing that in the form of an equation because it's the A that is the equation, the activity data, so let's get rid of it. We substitute it and we get a new equation for greenhouse gases and food security. And this is, this is where we think we can make progress. Now the amount of greenhouse gases from agriculture depends on three things. The food we eat, the emission intensity, and the productivity. And let me take them one by one, because this is the heart of the debate. Which food do we want to eat? Let me first show you one side of the story, and let's get the elephant out of the room. In Europe, we eat too much meat. We eat too much animal protein. Let's, let's be straight about that. In fact, in many countries, the animal protein consumption exceeds total protein requirements. As, and I'm using the WHO here as the, as, as the guideline. Okay? Also, the other truth, inconvenient truth, is that livestock production worldwide contributes to about 17% of total calorie intake, but is responsible for almost 80% of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So that, when you look at those graphs, that does not look good. Based on that, we've seen studies, very good studies, this is from Pete Smith's team in, in, in Scotland, that indeed show that how can we reduce emissions from agriculture? Well, if you look at what we can do on the farm, there's very little we can do. You can make 2%, 4% progress. If you look at consumption, changing consumption patterns, we can make more than double the progress. Okay, so that paper, very influential paper, is saying we should focus on, on consumption patterns rather than production patterns. But here's the other side of the story. This is a graph by Westhoek, another, I, I put in all these Dutch references into the presentation. No, it's a very famous graph by Westhoek from the protein, he's the author of the protein puzzle very influential uh, book. What we've been talking about in the last few slides is here, okay? It's Europe and North America. Our protein consumption exceeds what we need. Very large parts of the world, protein consumption is well below what is recommended by the WHO. And those are the parts with the largest populations. For example, this is Mali and Niger, I think, if, I'm not, if I know my flags. I think that if we consider that, then the question is, do we need more or do we need less, is the wrong question. Do we need more or less livestock produce is the wrong question. I want to divide this debate on livestock produce into three different classes. Let me first take out milk. Milk has an important role in food security, particularly the first 200 days no, not 200 days, 1,000 days uh, of, of, of childhood, famous, famous notion. This is a study from uh, Sweden where they compared the nutrient density index of many different drinks. So that's the inverse of greenhouse gas footprint, if you like. It's how many nutrients do you get for one kilo of greenhouse gases. And it shows that milk gives you more nutrients per greenhouse gas than many of the other drinks. Now, for some, that's not surprise. Beer is in here. But maybe a bit surprising is that milk gives you more nutrients than soya, than the equivalent soya drink, per kilogram of greenhouse gas. And what I propose is that let's park milk for the moment, because it has a role in food security. The second group that we then can look at is monogastrics, pigs and poultry. On the face of it, the footprint of monogastrics is very small. They have low emissions per kilogram meat, they have a low water demand per kilogram uh, meat, and they are efficient converters of plant protein into animal protein. But, there's one but, they <coughs> compete with us for cereals. They compete for arable land with us. That leaves us with the ruminants, which 
have very bad statistics, very high greenhouse gas footprint, very high water footprint, but they have one trick on the, up their sleeve. They can convert inedible protein that you and I cannot eat into something we can eat. And the question is, without ruminants, if we would ban ruminants, what would we do with our grasslands? What would we do with the Dutch boulders? What would we do with our mountain landscapes? The vast areas in Africa and Asia, and indeed the United States, that are covered by grass. What would we do with them? Some people say we should plow it up and, and grow crops. It's more and more efficient. Well, the last time anybody tried that yeah. was in the United States. And we know the results of that. Plowing up grassland, permanent grassland, mm -hmm. for arable production is a climate time bomb. Okay? It will take 100 years before you earn that back in terms of your carbon credits. So, my first handle, I'm going to call them handles, is should we replace that original question, more livestock produce, less livestock produce, should we replace that with a more with, 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 a, with a question that we can make more progress on. And for me that is, which food, for whom, grown where? That is something we can work on. Back to the equation. The second point I'd like to look at is the productivity. How productive we use our land and our animals. In the context of greenhouse gases, uh, we produced in Ireland in 2012 what we call a marginal abatement cost curve for agriculture. So it's where we looked at what, can we, what measures can we roll out on farms to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint. And we ranked them by cost effectiveness. So the width of each measure tells you how much progress you can make in, in greenhouse gas reductions, how many credits you can get, if you like. And the direction, whether they're going down or up, tells you whether a measure is cost beneficial or expensive, and that's how we've ranked them. We've color coded them, and we didn't color code them by measures on the left are green and on the right are blue, no. Green measures are measures based on efficiency, increased farm efficiency. For example, weight gain, accelerated weight gain in the beef, economic breeding index, improved economic breeding index in, in dairy systems, in extended grazing, um, nitrogen efficiency, and all those efficiency measures, it's no surprise, pay themselves back, are, are good for the pocket and good for the greenhouse gases. Now, that was the theory, but our colleagues in Ethan Ryan, that Trevor is, is with, have also measured that in our national farm survey, the, the FADEN, that's part of the FADEN network. So, they measured the economic performance of dairy farms, bottom third economic performance, mean, and the top third, and they measured the carbon footprint, or calculated the carbon footprint of those farms. And we also find here that the economic, the best economic performers have the lowest carbon footprint. Okay? And in greenhouse gases, it's a bit of a paradox. Intensification, intensive production practices usually reduce the carbon footprint. Okay? Intensification reduces the carbon footprint. Now, I can see Michael being worried there, and correctly so, because we have to keep an eye on the other aspects of sustainability. Because intensification is usually not good for water quality. It's usually not good for biodiversity. Okay? So my handle that I propose here is how can we ensure that intensification is sustainable intensification? That is where we, we need a lot more thought, a lot more research, and a lot more effort to make sure that sustainable intensification is indeed sustainable. Third handle, <coughs> emission intensity. We can, back to this slide, we can reduce, there's things we can do, technological solutions, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. For example, this is work from Gary and colleagues in, in, in Johnstone Castle, where we're working on novel fertilizer formulations. This is the standard calcium ammonium nitrate uh, fertilizer, and it's the nitrous oxide emissions associated with that. With these novel fertilizers, 
you can significantly reduce nitrous oxide emissions from these fertilizers without a yield penalty. Okay, that's a technological solution. The challenge here is that so far, blue here are the technological solutions, are expensive, particularly for the farmer. Now, these costs are changing. The novel fertilizers are becoming cheaper, a bit like computers. So, next year we'll do an update of this new marginal abatement cost curve. But, in general, the handle that we, or the question that we should ask, how can we reduce the cost of technological solutions? That's my third handle that we can make progress on. Okay, we've, we've, we've dealt with the equation, and that was the, the first sentence of the European Council conclusions. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quicker with the second sentence. <laughs> the second sentence basically says, we need policies where we not only count the negative aspects of agriculture on greenhouse gases, but also the positive. Now, what do we mean by that? This is the field behind my house, unfortunate. And what we measure in our inventories is the negative emissions, so the, the bad emissions. Methane from animals, ammonia from animals, nitrous oxides from soils, nitrate from soils. They are the ones that are included in the inventories. We know that agriculture also does other things. It sequesters carbon in the soil. We can sequester carbon with forestry, farm forestry. And we can offset some of our fossil fuel emissions by using bioenergy or forest byproducts, etc. Bioenergy generation. What the European Council conclusion in principle proposes is that we not only count the bad emissions, but also bring in the good aspects of land management. What does that mean? There's a lot of misunderstanding about what, what that means. Some people in the press in Ireland say, oh, Ireland, Ireland is looking for a free pass. No, it's not what it means. It means that simply means that we'll have more tools available in our toolbox. Because now we can work not only on reducing these, these bad emissions, but we can also try and work on increasing the good aspects of farming that previously we didn't get credits for in our inventories. <coughs> now, what does that entail? Land management, these good aspects. We did a scoping study where we looked at forestry. Currently, our, our, our forestries are a good sink, but as our Kyoto forests are, are maturing, that sink potential, actually in a business-as-usual scenario, is projected to decline. We also know that our grasslands are sequestering carbon, but because they're already sequestering so much, it's actually very difficult to increase that rate. But certainly, what we can do is work on drained organic soils, which are a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Where soils, organic soils were drained in the past, oxygen was allowed to enter. Also, there's also a very relevant discussion in the Netherlands. Previously, that wasn't thought to be a big problem, but with the new IPCC guidelines, the default emission factors from drained organic soils was increased from about one ton per hectare to 19 tons per hectare. So where previously thought, we thought it was a little source, now we think they are giant hotspots. Very relevant for the Dutch polders. Also very relevant for Ireland, where we've seen a lot of drainage in the past. So we need to add to our equation now. We need to add the change net change in carbon stock in our soils. That is the fourth handle that we can work with. Because the first thing we should do is plug the carbon leaks. This is a study we've done where we were able to model the benefits and costs of, of, of drainage. Now, the benefits are clear. When we drain land, it increases the primary productivity and the number of days that we can graze the land, the trafficable days. And we know that for every day extra grazing, we earn about 5 euros per hectare. So if we extend it by, by, by 30 days, that's 150 euros per year. We also know that drainage comes at the expense of carbon loss, and more in some areas and less in other areas. Okay? So now we can ask, here are the benefits for the different areas of drainage. Here are the costs in terms of carbon loss. What is the, what is the ratio? Where is that balance? Where is the optimum? 
This didn't work the last time either. There's the slide that um, I do apologize. This is a, a Windows to MacBook uh, problem where I had an animation where you see the map changing color. Basically, I'll, I'll have to tell you that at lib. Basically, at, it depends on carbon price. At the current carbon price, which is very low, six, seven, I think it's seven now, euros per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent on, on the international market. At the current price, the ben economic benefits of draining far outweigh the carbon penalty, if you like. Now, Joe asked me a question the last time, but are you using the right price? Even if we use a price of 30 euros per ton, it still outweighs. But if the price goes in the direction of 100 euros per ton, then the equation flips around. Now the carbon penalties exceed the economic benefit. Now, for me, that informs the debate. And, and of course, we have to keep in mind that, that for the, the farmer only experiences one side of the equation, the benefits, because the penalties don't apply to, to farm level. The state experiences the other side of the equation, the penalties. So there's, a, there's an interesting debate to be had. Right. The other thing we can do is enhanced sequestration. And this is where the department has recently published a new uh, afforestation scheme incentive for farmers to, to increase forestry, with a view to making sure that that same potential doesn't decline. So the fourth handle, the last handle, is how can integrated land management, because that's what we're talking about, an integration of the agricultural productivity with how we manage our land and the carbon in our land, how can we govern that? There's a lot of work to be done there. Now, the final sentence, very briefly, in the council conclusions basically says we don't know yet how to do this but we'll come up with a plan before 2020 and it, it technically it's the, the, the council called on the commission to, to investigate this the, the commission started that process with a consultation a public consultation on how this can best be done we made a submission ourselves the department of agriculture made a submission and many around us here made, made, made their own submissions and the commission is now finalizing that into uh, a, a new proposal for how we can account for integrated plan, for, for um, the Lula CF sector effectively within the 2030 climate framework. Now, of course, all of this is in preparation of Paris next month, where the UNFCCC will, will or will not, but hopefully will agree on its own roadmap for, for agriculture. Of course, the French host is very strongly advocating the, the the 4 per mille uh, initiative, the, the 4 per thousand, to increase soil carbon by 4 uh, per thousand units. And our own, what we discussed here about integrated land management, is reasonably well aligned with the French proposal. Now, that leaves me with my conclusions. We started with the debate on do we need more agriculture or less agriculture? Do we need more livestock or less livestock? That's where the debate is stuck. What I propose is that we move the debate to four discussion points that we can make progress on as a society. One is, which food do we need? For whom? Produce where? That's a debate where we can make progress. The second one is, can we make sure that intensification is indeed sustainable intensification? And how do we do that? The third question is, can we reduce the cost of technological solutions? How can we do that? And you, you, you go into the whole innovation sphere there. How can we incentivize that? And finally, how can we govern integrated land management in terms of plugging carbon sources and increasing sinks? Now, I hope that if, the public, if in the public debate we can move to these questions, that we can progress towards a common shared goal. Thank you very much for your attention.